No Country for Old Men is as perfect of a movie as the Coen brothers have ever made, and that is certainly saying something. It's an engrossing cat and mouse thriller, a model of flawless storytelling, and an exploration of the evil in the world and how it can or can't be dealt with. The pacing is impeccable. 90 seconds after meeting the character of Llewellyn Moss, he spots a suspicious trail of blood, and the audience is already interested in what's happening, and it doesn't let up. The character of Anton Chigurh savagely and graphically murders a sheriff's deputy before we even get a clear look at his face. And when we do, this is the look we get. This is all in the first five minutes, and the story continues to grip the audience for the rest of the film. Llewellyn on the run, Chigurh after him, Sheriff Ed Tom Bell after them both. They leave their marks on each other, and innocent people get caught in the crossfire. But there's never a dull moment. More important than the pacing is that we learn so much about these characters with little to no dialogue or exposition. For instance, with Llewellyn, we see that he's calm, yeah. determined, hardened, ain't no lobos. cautious. All within a few minutes, and all of him barely speaking. In addition to the character development, the absence of dialogue can help move the story along more effectively than wordy exposition. All we need to hear is the phone ringing, both in Llewellyn's ear and downstairs at the front desk. And we know what this means. We know what this gesture means. No words are needed. And after all the imagery of blood trails and boots, we know what this means. On top of the visuals, there is no music or score to shatter the reality of this film. The soundtrack of the movie is nothing more than the sounds of our world. This bridges the gap between the viewer and the universe of the story, as if we were watching the story take place through a window to our backyards rather than on a movie screen. Which makes the characters all the more real, and all the more terrifying. Usually the most important thing to note of any villain, or really any character, is what motivates him. Understanding what drives his behavior helps inform who he is and can tell a lot about him as a character. Some of the simpler villains have very well-defined motivations. Often greed, lust for power, or some cause that runs counter to the cause of the hero. Dead meat. Some of the better villains are motivated by something that's a little less obvious. The future, Mr. Gitz. The future but often the most complex and intriguing villains don't have clear or definable motivations. Everything becomes chaos. The lack of a simple answer of what they're after just adds depth to their character and makes them all the more fascinating. Some viewers have likened Anton Chigurh to the Antichrist, an angel of death, while others have compared him to more of an angel of God, bringing justice to those who are profiting from drug deals or, in the case of Llewellyn, taking things that don't belong to them. Literary comparisons and theories aside, what's clear is that Chigurh isn't after money or power. In the novel upon which the film is based, he actually returns the satchel of money to its rightful owners in the end. His motivations seem to lie elsewhere. I might even say he has principles, principles that transcend money or drugs or anything like that. In the simplest terms, Chigurh is a man doing what he thinks is right. There is a moral code that exists, and he is just an agent of that code. His job is to recover the money, and anyone who gets in the way of that, even the man who hired him, must be dealt with. He gave the Mexicans a receiver. He feels, he felt that the more people looking... That's foolish. You pick the one right tool. While this gives him a bit of an ego... It will be brought to me and placed at my feet. He believes that there are higher powers outside of himself. Call it fate. It's been traveling 22 years to get here. And now it's here. And it's either heads or tails. Or honor. But I gave my word. And that, in a way, reduces his culpability for his actions. At least in his mind. You need to call it. I can't call it for you. Well, it wouldn't be fair. It's also worth noting how little he values human life. Notice the juxtaposition of these two lines, spoken directly after one another. Would you hold still, please, sir? Can you hold still? And the fact that his weapon of choice is used to kill Steer. Shoots out a little rod about that far into the brain, sucks right back in, animal never knows what hit him. Both implying that he equates human life with any other animal. 
And how about the coin that saved this man's life? What are we going to mix in with the others and become just a coin? Which it is. Combine this with his utter relentlessness, it's easy to call him a manifestation of evil. That's what this story boils down to. Characters trying to survive in a world where evil not only exists, but overpowers them. Therefore, Shigur doesn't really need to be well-defined, because the most important aspect of his character is how other characters respond to him and deal with his presence. You know, sometimes I think he's pretty much a ghost. Uh, he's real, all right. Llewellyn tries to run from him, defend himself from him, and engage him. I decided to make you a special project of mine. You ain't gonna have to come look for me at all. But eventually the perils of this world get the best of Llewellyn. Carson Wells tries to bribe him. Take you to an ATM, there's 14 grand in it. But he can't be bought. An ATM. Carla Jean tries to reason with him and questions his very principles. The coin don't have no say. It's just you. But he's too self-assured to be reasoned with. Well, I got here the same way the coin did. So it seems the evil in the world is not only unbeatable and unstoppable, but also incomprehensible. That don't make sense. Sheriff Ed Tom Bell's opening monologue voices this fear. The crime you see now, it's hard to even take its measure. It's not that I'm afraid of it, but I don't want to push my chips forward and go out and meet something I don't understand. Which is why Ed Tom spends most of the film hiding from the action. I might mind you. Any new bodies accumulate out there? No, sir. Well, then I guess I can skip it. That DEA agent called again. You don't want to talk to him? I'm going to try to keep from it as much as I can. Because he's afraid to face this incomprehensible evil head on. And once he catches a glimpse of it, he quits. I feel overmatched. So whether you call Shigur a representation of evil or death or just a bad man. Yeah, he's a psychopathic killer, but so what? There's plenty of them around. He relentlessly pursues, and he's an ever-present threat of harm. The man would have to put his soul at hazard. And there have always been men like Shigur. What you got ain't nothing new. This country's hard on people. And there will always be men like Shigur, no matter what we do. And even if Ed Tom retires to a life of restlessly hiding from evils that he can't understand or hope to overcome, they're still out there. You can't stop what's coming. They ain't all waiting on you. And the reality is that we as the audience live in this world as well, where people like this and evil like this exist. And any hope we have for an escape from this evil is fixing to make a fire somewhere out there and all that dark and all that cold. In this life or the next, I knew that whenever I got there, he'd be there. Is nothing but a dream. And then I woke up. That's a dead dog. Yes, it is.